This is me with my little sister Lisa. Lisa was affected by multiple disabilities in her life. and She had to have a tracheostomy due to paralysed vocal cords, which she had reversed eventually. These are my other siblings for context. And the following is an interview with my mum Christine, in which she describes her experience as a parent of a disabled child and how, as Lisa grew to adulthood, she was influenced by that experience. Lisa was born on the 8th of August, 1984. And when did you first realise she had disabilities? Um, as soon as she was born, she was struggling to breathe. Um, breathing in was a problem for her. So she was taken away, put in, into an incubator. And it must have been the next day, I think, we found out that she had paralysed vocal cords. But that was all we knew. I suspected something because I felt that... Her presentation wasn't as you would expect. She didn't curl up into the fetal position. She was stretched out as if she has spasticity in her legs, but none of that was mentioned, so I didn't mention it. And I just hoped that I was wrong. Um, but within five days, she'd had a tracheostomy fitted because her vocal cords wouldn't open wide enough for her to breathe in properly. And in hindsight, we don't know whether she was born with brain damage or whether it was those five days of not getting enough oxygen in that caused the brain damage. But at the end of the day, it made no difference, whatever the cause was. And how did you react? At the time, you just wanted to survive. At the time, you just think, you know, Please not let it be anything life-threatening. Um, and then you slowly come to realise that this is going to be a, a lifelong thing, even with just the tracheostomy. We had to stay in hospital. Well, I had to stay in hospital for, must have been about eight weeks, learning how to make sure the secretions were sucked out appropriately, make sure I could do physio, make sure that I could change the, the trache, um make sure that we could feed it properly because as you know babies don't have a lot of neck so just feeding her could a chin could block off an airway and things like this so it was it was quite quite intense the first six eight weeks and all I wanted to do was to get her home but by the time we did come home I realized the enormity of what we were facing and people's attitudes as well were very strange because at the time we didn't know she had cerebral palsy, we didn't know she had epilepsy, we didn't know she had learning difficulties. She was only, you know, eight, two months old, eight weeks old. And we got one congratulations card, which, you know, she was number four. So it was not something I ever expected that you wouldn't celebrate the birth of a child, but nobody did. I got one card off my cousin um, who lived in London, I think at the time, I can't remember. Um, and I was absolutely mortified and realised that there was a stigma associated with a child that was seen to be flawed um, and that was hard, that was really hard, and knowing that whereas you can, you know, your other kids can go and play in other people's houses, that was never going to happen for her because nobody was medically trained. The only people that ever stepped up to to learn how to look after a trackie outside of the immediate family was my mum and Big George, and they were there within minutes of a coming home how do you do it how do it you know how do I change this how do I give you a break if you see what I mean um and it wasn't until 
I was sobbing to my mum and saying how devastated I was that nobody thought she was worth celebrating. That my mother got onto the phone to every human being she knew to tell them off. And then we got a lot of congratulations cards, but people's attitudes were hurtful um the person who was my friend during my pregnancy and I'd asked her to be godmother never heard from her again didn't want to know um I have no friends left from pre-Lisa none whatsoever um which I don't care about anymore but I did at the time um so yeah, it 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 was hard because even though I loved her with every ounce of my being, I just thought I can't cope with this. I cannot live with this. And I didn't want it. Sorry. I used to put her to bed at night and pray that she'd be dead in the morning. Even though I knew that I loved her so much, but I couldn't cope with it. I couldn't cope with that um, stigma that people made me feel. You know, like your other nan, the first thing she said was, well, there's none of that in our family. My response to that was, I know, because she's gorgeous and you're all funk ugly. But I st it still hurt. It really, really hurt. And I think... Now, I know it was part of the grieving process. I know that now, but at the time, I didn't. And over the years, I saw other parents of disabled kids going through that same process. And it was nice to be able to say to them, do you know what, this will end, you won't feel like this. And it was lovely seeing them come through that journey. But I didn't have anyone to tell me that. I didn't have anyone to tell me that this was a journey that you would go through. And that the chances were, if you were strong enough, you'd see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we were not given any support with regards to what else might be going on and they must have known because at that time I even I recognized the signs of cerebral palsy you know the extended legs the extended muscles um so they must have known in the hospital but there was nothing at all there was nobody ever s sat me down and said look she may have um, she may have brain damage, there may be other things to come, there may be, you know, more hurdles to get over. And for the next sort of 12 months, we just lived in hope that she'd catch up. But with having three other children, you notice the difference. And, you know, people would say, oh, isn't she crawling yet? Isn't she sitting up yet? Isn't isn't she doing this that and and it it brings it home to you that they are comparing her to what they consider to be a normal child um and again that adds to the stigma it adds to the feeling that you've done something wrong by giving birth to something that's not perfect that's defective that's deviating from the expected norm um and it, it people would say how many kids have you got and i'd say i've got three and and then explain and when i look back i want to punch myself because i let society do that to me i let people's expectations do that to me because i'd never thought about it before and to my shame i hadn't but it's not something you expect. Um, so I was grieving for the child I thought I was gonna have, the little girl in frilly pants climbing up a slide and playing in the park, whilst also feeling this stigma 
that other people made me feel. I can't I can't really explain it, but every parent I know have has gone through that that process because of the way society views disability as something that is wrong and that is something that needs fixing and it doesn't it doesn't need fixing it's perfectly fine but I didn't know that then I did not understand at all she hadn't taught me then my kids hadn't taught me then um but I'm so glad they did I'd never thank them enough, never thank her enough, but I'm so glad that I went on, that I was, I had the support to go on the journey that I did. Life changed massively. Um, you know, I had my four children within sort of seven years, so they were all pretty young. And all of a sudden, they had to grow up. They had to learn what was appropriate and what wasn't appropriate. Um, and you, as my eldest son, were caring for her from the day she was born. You were like, I can't even describe to you what it was like. You were like a policeman hovering everywhere. And, and, and yet Jamie and Alex, who were younger than you, just carried on as normal throwing her around the room with you sort of going don't do this don't do that don't do the mm. other whereas th you were like a mini adult um and i can remember before we got the electric suction pump we had the foot pump um that was given to us by the hospital and we'd be driving down the road or going to school or whatever and she'd need a tracky sucking out and you'd be like pumping away in the back on this thing and, and the others are just sitting there completely oblivious to it, which was lovely in itself, but it was it was a massive responsibility and I think we missed out so much um, because the only person that would ever, ever look after Lisa was my mum and she worked full time. So if we wanted to take you swimming, we couldn't take take you. If we didn't have a babysitter, we couldn't do lots of things where we wouldn't be able to stop, get the suction pump out. And, you know, you don't realise how much that affects you. you. You couldn't go to the cinema, you know, things like this because nobody wanted to hear that in the middle of the cinema and nobody wanted to hear Lisa shouting and yelling, which, you know, because she wouldn't have been interested. But yeah, life did change and I think it didn't change for the better at the beginning. It changed for the worse and just pushing a buggy down the street as she got a bit bigger why, and she was in like a you know, the big buggy. Um, I can't even remember what it was called, but it was obviously not an ordinary buggy. And people would comment that she was lazy, that she wasn't walking. Why wasn't she walking? Um, and things like this. And, and you'd get people in the street coming up to you and saying, what's wrong with her? And I'd say, nothing. You know, nothing's wrong with her. She hasn't got a headache, I don't think. You know, she hasn't got a cold. She's fine. But that was my defense mechanism because I actually did think there was something wrong with it and it was and at that day that changed my life that I talked about at her funeral will stay with me forever because it was the that pivotal moment in my life that made me realize that I was the luckiest luckiest person on the planet and that was Sunday morning and the three of you had got up and you were jumping up and down on the bed Lisa's cot was next to the bed because she could never be out of our sight and we heard this little noise and she was pulling herself up on the bars of the cot to see what all the noise was because she was shouting and yelling and being gormless as you normally were and all of a sudden there was silence as the three of you just 
stared at her as she was pulling herself up and she was 15 months old and then she sat up and let go of the bars and the three of you all just got into the cot, grabbed her, threw her in the air, were telling her how clever she was, that she was the cleverest person on the planet because at 15 months she'd sat up for about 10 seconds on her own and I just thought, God, you can't buy that. How many parents see that? You don't, you just take everything for granted. My kids didn't. They knew her value. They knew the value of that little person sitting in that cot and I didn't. I didn't realise that she was making them into better people, more accepting people, less judgmental people, beautiful people. Yeah, they all beat the living crap out of each other on a daily basis. And that was the best day, best day. Because I knew then that I would, I'd been blessed. I hadn't been punished. And I just thought, Christ, that kid's amazing. And that was the beginning of the rest of my life. And anyone who couldn't see that was no longer in my life. Um, and that turned the corner for me. Okay, I mean, the whole thing was a journey because we found out that she obviously had learning difficulties. She started having seizures about 18 months old. Um, we, you know, realised that she had cerebral palsy. So all of those sort of support networks were put in place. She was getting physio um, at... Sefton Resource Centre which was just the best thing ever it's a pity they closed it because that's where we met other parents that's where you could laugh and joke about things without you know being judged um, and we got to the point where we were caring constantly we'd have a Friday night off where you'd all go to to your nans and you know, and that was the one break we got. It was hard. If she had a cold, I could be out of bed over a hundred times in the night, sucking the secretions out. It gets so bad that I'd walk into the wall, I'd walk into the door because I was so exhausted. Um, there was no access to... Um, respite at that time especially with her having a tracky um but then i was obsessed with research obsessed with it and i would read medical journals um and i used to have to go to the library because you know there was no sort of internet stuff going on then and you know look up all kinds of stuff and i saw this article from um, a consultant in America who was talking about nerve re-innovation in um, vocal cords so that they would use nerves from the diaphragm, implant them into the vocal cords so that the brain thinks it's, you know, expanding the diaphragm, but actually it, was, it would then open the vocal cords so I went to my next ENT appointment with Lisa and I had a copy of this that I gave to the consultant that I saw and he was absolutely gobsmacked because he'd not heard anything about it and he promised me that he'd get in touch with this man in America and let me know what, what he said. So he did, he got in touch and um, he, the consultant in America said he was coming over to the children's hospital in Leeds to teach the consultant there how to do this technique and if he wanted to go along he could go along and watch as well so he told me he said yes I'm going to go see what I think and um, he said and we'll talk about it when you come in so I went in he showed me the letter from 
the the gentleman in America that said about inviting him to go and watch, but he also mentioned the fact that Lisa had learning difficulties and if she didn't need to speak, why did she need to have the tracky reverse? So why waste your time and effort? And my consultant was mortified. He was absolutely mortified. And he said to me, he said, Christine, if I do this, she'll be my first. And he went to Leeds. He watched the um, consultant show the consultant in Leeds. He watched the consultant in Leeds perform an operation. So that was two. Came back to Alder Hay and he did the nerve re-innovation on Lisa. So she was the third person in the country to have it done. Um, whereas normally someone with learning difficulties would have been at the back of the queue. And I will forever be grateful to him because he treated her like he would any other young person. Whereas that hadn't been my experience with a lot of health professionals who came very much from the medical model um, that if you couldn't fix the person why bother so I was very very grateful for him because the difference it made to Lisa not having that trackie because she loved water she was like a little mermaid she'd practically get up and walk out of a wheelchair to get to the pool because she loved water that much I am um, she you, you, trying to hoist her into the water she pull the hoist over, pull people into the pool where they're just trying to get to the water because she loved it. So the difference it made to her quality of life was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Whew. Well, before Lisa, it was, you know, whatever job you could get being a parent of four kids. After Lisa and once I was in a position of having Alan to be supportive of me doing it, I was I went to university um, and I did a degree in disability and community studies and applied social science, which made me extremely political, extremely ranty, um, but also much more aware of how society view disabled people and the reasons for that. Um, and I think people don't analyse that enough. They really don't. But when you look back at history, the normalisation of disabled people was very much um, influenced by the Industrial Revolution. You know, if you've got a factory, you, you build a factory for people with two arms and two legs. So if you've got someone with one arm or no legs, then things become a lot more difficult. People were more rural before then. They come into cities where if you don't conform to that norm, a lot of places aren't as accessible to you. And therefore, the, the, the sort of exclusion of disabled people from society was much more prevalent and then it became much more common. And then it became the norm to sort of put them into homes or put them into institutions or because they weren't useful to society. And it all made sense then where this stigma came from and I just it made me so angry when sort of the inclusion agenda came up because Lisa went to specialist provision and she had friends who didn't judge her and who would wheel her wheelchair around the wheel around the, the playground at 150 miles an hour until she was hanging out and who absolutely loved her whether she could speak or whether she wouldn't and yet I ha I knew people who sent their disabled children into mainstream school and they were left in a room on their own with sensory toys and a teaching assistant they didn't have teachers because it wasn't inclusion it was integration 
it's not the same it absolutely isn't the same and I used to get so frustrated because I I thought this thing was you know well we can have like one disabled person in every every class in school and that'll be great and I'm thinking but why can't they have a community if you said today you're only allowed one gay person in every class because then they can integrate better you, you're taking away the support network you're taking away the camaraderie you're taking away that sense of belonging if you said oh we can only have one black person in each classroom and sort of include them in there well yeah great we want to include people but not to the detriment of making them feel like the only person that's like that the only person that's disabled the only person that's that's gay the only person that's black i don't get it why do you want to normalize people when people are perfectly perfect however they are and it made me so angry and i made a video at university showing that because they would a lot of the health professionals that were there would come out with this normalization agenda which is making people as normal as possible so that they are integrated and it some of the advice i got was well you know if your disabled sibling child brother auntie uncle whoever if you're taking them out and they like um a teddy give them something that's more age appropriate that's not a teddy give them a handbag uh, if lisa wants a teddy she can have a bloody teddy i really it's nothing to do with you and if you're offended by it it's your issue and don't take them all out in a group take them out on their own so that people don't cross the road i'm thinking they cross the road they cross the road i don't care it's their issue and i did a video of Lisa playing with her toys and she must have been 13 maybe so Alex was what how old much older than her is she 18 months something like that two years Alex is sitting there reading her girly magazines Lisa's playing with her toys etc and we sat her on the, the sofa and you were there son because you were playing the, the kazoo afterwards but we sat her on the sofa, tried to get her to watch East Enders and play with a magazine, and she ate it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Why should she have to do what her elder sister does? Because it doesn't offend you. Ah, no. She can play with any toy she wants. She can play with her little musical toys that say yellow a hundred times. And I don't care if it offends you sod off because you're not welcome in my life in my home or anywhere that I am and why why should any disabled person on this planet try to make themselves more acceptable to you there was a um a, a man I was on my degree with who was affected by thalidomide he's been on the telly a couple of times very articulate articulate man and he said the first 10 years of his life was spent trying to make legs for him. And he said, it wasn't until I had my own voice that I can say, just give us a wheelchair. I don't need legs. And <laughs> my point exactly, he can drive his, his car, he can you know drive into the van and he can drive it perfectly well without false legs he can get around absolutely amazingly without false legs he doesn't need to be and that goes towards talking about uh when you talk about the medical model before i mean we talk about the social model yeah. in terms of like people being exactly who they are and um, then we make adjustments and, yeah. then, and then that's that's far more inclusive than normalization absolutely of course it is because if you can't get your wheelchair somewhere it's not your fault it's the steps fault if we adapt our environment, then we are including people. Until we adapt the environment, until we adapt people's attitudes, we're never going to be an inclusive society. We're always going to look down on disabled people as someone. And when you think, how angry did it make me when I realised that the only 
anti-discriminatory legislation that has justifiable discrimination is disability discrimination legislation in the Equality Act. It's the only one where you can justify discriminating against someone. And the majority of the time, it's due to money. Well, it's neoliberalism. That's, that's, it's a business thing. So, no. I just, it makes me so, so angry. And it, as I say, that passion that I already felt but couldn't articulate as well because I didn't understand the history. I didn't understand the whole social um, discrimination about it, really. The whole, the reason why we feel, you know, we feel the stigma, the reason why disabled people come across the barriers that they do. And once I understood that, I just thought, no, I need to, my, my role now needs to be teaching other people that, helping other, other parents. And that's what led me to the job I did, which was at first it was parent partnership, once I'd done my degree um, for the council. And that was supporting parents um, of disabled children and children with SEN to access their rights within education. That soon developed into the SEN and Disability Information Advice and Support Service following the changes in uh, 2014, um, which brought in health and social care. But it was the same role, only harder, because there was far less funding um, to support disabled people and disabled young people. But for 20 years, I was able to use my experience, my knowledge, my training to support parents who were fighting the system constantly to access things that their child needed or supporting young people to access what they needed. You know, supporting parents at tribunal, both SEN Tribunal and Disability Discrimination Tribunal um, and there was nothing nicer <laughs> than seeing a parent being successful and getting what the child needs and I think at first you bring every case home and you don't sleep because it takes it back to the fights that you've had over the years but then you realise that you can't fix everything. It's not in my power to fix everything. And I, once I realised that I couldn't fix everything, as long as I did everything I could possibly do, then that had to be enough. So it became much more um, manageable, if that makes sense. And the fact that the, the two people I, I was working with were exactly the same as me, whereas as passionate as me and you know we just we loved it until we didn't until it it got to the point where I mean I don't know if this is something I should be talking about I don't know but until the fight was too hard um, because everybody wanted us to not tell parents what the legislation said because if we did it would cost money and the money wasn't there and people's attitudes changed um in a lot of the other support services within the council because they couldn't assess on need anymore they only they could only assess on resources and then we were supporting parents to access things that were going to cost more money. So it was just fight after fight after fight. And it was exhausting. Um, and it, it did, it broke me. 
absolutely broke me. Um, the bullying, the intimidation broke me all at a time when we were fighting for our our own support for Lisa as well because we were getting older. I couldn't do any of the personal care um, anymore. I, you know, Alan had to do all of the personal care. And one day you have access to 55 hours of independent living fund. And because Lisa was two to one, she was so complex. That meant like 20 odd hours um a week support so we could have two nights sleep a week and a weekend that we could do stuff with the grandchildren and when that went and the social work came back and said i've given all your information to the panel and they have offered you eight hours support and this is me late 50s <laughs> and uh that meant four hours of care. So by the time I'd finished running around the house screaming, hysterical, I threatened, I just said, go and get a car now. Go and get, I'll pack a bag. You go and find somewhere that can support someone as complicated as her for eight hours a week. I said, do it, go on, because I'm finished. That's it, I'm done. Absolutely finished. I can't fight anymore. And she was lovely, don't get me wrong, she did fight for us, but whatever the panel says goes. And she went back, she sort of left, went back and said she meant it. She absolutely meant it. I didn't mean it. She knew I didn't mean it, but she was very supportive and I'll always be thankful for that. And we ended up getting... Um, 50 hours back and the two carers that did her care did the same anyway but for less money um so we were very very lucky because those carers did become part of the family but if that it, for me it was so hard because we were getting older and less able to do things and yet we were being seen as grabbing things that we weren't really entitled to like we asked for when we were having the adaptations done for it and having hoists put in we asked if um we could have some respite for her to not be here because if you remember this room was the kitchen and there was brick dust everywhere and and the person I spoke to said, well, you get a, a really good care package. I said, I don't get a care package. I said, Lisa gets a care package. I said, it's not going to affect my lungs if I'm breathing in the brick dust. I said, but it is for her. Didn't give a damn, didn't care. So Debbie took her anyway, and she stayed there for a week until all the debris had gone and she could come back more safely but I wasn't the only one going through that all my parents were going through those kinds of things and it's hard enough on the day to day and I'm I'm trying not to be negative because every day was a joy every day getting up to that smile was a joy it was the best thing in the world, but physically and emotionally, it was the outside that gave you the stress. It was the other people that you, you're supposed to be able to rely on for support that gave you the stress, not the person who is disabled, which is really, really sad because I'm sure that's what breaks people. It's not having the responsibility of a disabled person. It's having the fight. 
to have their needs accessed so that they can lead comfortable, joyous lives. I was too old to take Lisa to Blackpool and put her on a ride, but Debbie could do that, but I couldn't. Why couldn't she do that? Just because she needed two to one care. It was like, well, no, she can stay in the house. Why can't she go to the pub? I couldn't take her because by seven o'clock every night, I'm lying in bed because I was knackered, being up, seeing to her if she had a seizure, changing her if she needed changing, etc., etc. You never had a full night's sleep. You just didn't. But why couldn't she do those things? Why wasn't it deemed as important for her to access experiences that everyone else takes for granted on a daily basis? And without Debbie and Yvonne, and Debbie and Yvonne's kids, she would not have had any of those experiences. And there's the, the risk benefit factor as well. I would not take any risks with Lisa. I wouldn't give it a burger in case she choked, because I'm a mum. So I'm always, always looking out for the risk of anything. But Debbie would give it a burger and not tell me. But that's the same as you going out, getting bladdered and falling down. If I don't know, I'm not going to worry. <laughs> but it's the same things your kids always take some risks. And I think, you know, Debbie giving her a fireman's lift up a flight of stairs to get to somewhere they wanted to go she would do that I couldn't do it but I'm always grateful that she had those experiences she ran the half marathon dressed as Father Christmas in a wheelchair with her like I could have ever done that so that care package wasn't for me alone it wasn't for us that was for Lisa to experience life that we couldn't give her that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Again, it's about, she's a person. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So. And do you know what else it did as well? Because we had George after Lisa, he missed out on so much more than even you did because we could take Lisa to the park when she was little, but we couldn't even do that with him because she loved the swing. We had one in the garden that was adapted for her, but there wasn't one in a park. So he couldn't do all those things that we could do when she was tiny because we could put her into the baby swing and swinger and things like that. So we could do then, we could do more with George as he was getting to like 10 or 11 that we'd never been able to do, do in the past with him. So that support helped every person in the family, including my grandkids that, that I then had because we could then spend time with them. Whereas... You can't give them the same care when you've got a 30-year-old a presenting like a nine-month-old baby and a nine-month-old baby. And without that support, she wouldn't have had any quality of life and neither would we, I don't think. 18th of December... 2017 was when Lisa died um, after being in hospital for five days because she had a brain tumour and we didn't know which I will forever feel guilty over um her presentation had changed from sort of august september um she wasn't crawling around as much she would normally crawl through here go into the kitchen and shove her head in the washing machine and she'd stop doing that the furthest she'd get is sort of here and this was sort of happening gradually so we didn't really notice it in october she started crying and holding her neck she never cried lisa never ever cried unless she was really in pain 
So we knew she was in pain and we, we called out the 24 hour doctor who came out and examined her. Before the doctor get, got there, she had a massive seizure and it must have been about one o'clock in the morning. So it was automatically put down as a pre-seizure symptom because we couldn't think of anything else. She, she examined her all over. She was very good. She, you know, climbed onto the bed with her and um, we couldn't see what it, what it was. Um, she was going to the day centre in the daytime and she we'd get the notes back saying she'd eaten this, she'd eaten that. And she was still eating okay. Um, and then as the weeks progressed, the physio saw her and the OT saw her and they thought, well, it could be because they'd not been putting her into a walking frame, which we didn't know that she hadn't been accessing that. And apparently it was because something had happened to the hoist, but we didn't know that they had a specialist hoist sling. So we were trying to access another hoist sling to try and get her. And then we took her to the doctors and we said, look, there's something going on. It's not right. She really, that we, we need to know what it is, please. Can you just give us an idea of what these symptoms might show? It was a doctor that she'd never seen before. He was very nice and he said, well, you know, we'll take some bloods, etc. She might be depressed. Do you want to try an antidepressant medication? I'm thinking, oh my God, this kid's the happiest person on the planet. She's not a kid. She was 32, 33. Um, so it's definitely nothing to do with her mood. Um, so they said they'd get a district nurse to come out and do blood tests and the district nurse came couldn't get a vein and we just said you know what we're going to take it to A&E because we just we can't put everything down to a disability we just can't it's not her disability that's causing these issues so we went to the Zachary hospital and they were really good they brought her in um, they did a scan on her, her stomach and they said well she might not be eating properly because she's really bunged up and we say no she's really bunged up because she's not drinking um, that is another symptom whatever's going on that's a symptom that's not the cause and we were in there from Thursday and on the Saturday we were begging them to do a scan absolutely begging and they did um, a CAT scan and Alex and I were with her and the doctor came back to the ward and just said would you like to come to the family room and I just went no no <laughs> no I don't want to come to the family room I, I want to stay here and you can just shut the curtains because I'm not going to the family room I'm not leaving her not for a minute and that's when he told us that she'd got a huge brain tumour on the side of her neck, head there, that where she'd been holding. Um, and he didn't think there was any option for treatment. And we were sent to Walton Neuro next door and we saw an amazing consultant he came out in the middle of the night and said he wanted to do an MRI just to make sure um, and would that be okay and then we had another doctor come in who said oh I believe you're having an MRI what's the point with her presentation what's the point so even then her value was being judged as being less than someone else's and this doctor said well she might die under the anaesthetic anyway 
so why bother? So Alan was mortified. He wanted to keep her as long as possible, obviously. And he was like, well, we won't have it done then. We won't have it done. And then the previous doctor came back a couple of hours later and said, I believe you're not having the MRI done. Why aren't you having the MRI done? So we told him. A couple of minutes later, there was a huge argument going on a few feet away outside of the room. And he came back in and he said, she's not going to die under the anaesthetic. We need to do this so that we know 100% what we're dealing with. So, um, she had the MRI. Alex went down with her in the, the bed and she said it was great because she said we were, they were the two, um, porters that were with her they were running in with the bed and she was like wee she thought it was great because they were actually running down the hill in the corridor and uh, they said she was just amazing they you know had to do the anaesthetic otherwise she wouldn't have gone into the MRI and then he came back and and told us that she'd probably got weeks left and how sorry he was and then um, the palliative care team were just phenomenal and um, we just said we want to take her home because if we haven't got long, don't want her to go here. We want her to be at home. So I, I'm, I can't even remember her name, but oh my God, this woman was just phenomenal. And I wish I could remember her name, but we were just in shock. She had the, the pain meds because she was increasingly in pain. She had it all organised with the... Um, syringe driver she organised a bed to be delivered so that the bed could be there for it in the daytime that we could put her in her room of a night but that she might not be comfortable sitting or on the floor in the day so they had a bed she organised that to be delivered and on the Sunday was it the Sunday or the Monday son I think it might have been the Monday we got she came home with us in the ambulance to bring her home and um, Lisa was pretty unresponsive at the time but I think the pain meds were um, making her more peaceful she was less agitated and um, we had all the Christmas decorations up and the fire on you lot had all come here first and got candles lit and it was all lovely and we thought right we'll put Moana on because she loved the Moana songs and we'd all sit and have a whiskey and make sure she was fine and we brought her home and we put her in granddad's chair if you remember and you were sat holding her hand and I was on the phone to my best friend Shirley who'd just gone the chippy and was taking some tea home so she was only around the corner and it was just beautiful because there was just my five kids me and Alan in this lovely lovely environment with Moana on and it was all peaceful and it was all lovely and you said she's not breathing mum and I threw the phone on the floor so Shirley could still hear everything that was going on and I was trying to get her to breathe and Alex stood there and she said let her go mum let her go And within 10 seconds, Shirley was here. 
obviously at Chippy Teat going cold in the car. <laughs> and um, it was just a blur from then on. She just organised everything. She sorted everything out. She made sure we could stay here with Lisa overnight, that Lisa wouldn't be taken away. And we all slept here. We all stayed all at the, around the bed and held a hand all night. She organised for the doctor to come out. She organised everything. And unbeknownst to me, there's a, a new thing that you ring up and you tell one person that someone has died and they inform everybody else. And she had to give her name and address in as the person who was informing them. And unbeknownst to me, I only found out last week, she got a bill for the overpaid direct debit, direct payments for her care. And she paid it and never even told me. Um, and I said to her a couple of days ago, I said, if it wasn't for you, Sheila, I said, Lisa would still be sitting in that chair because I wouldn't have known what to do because all the things I've been told that I had to do when it happened, I'd forgotten. We were just in shock. And it was the worst and the most beautiful day of my life because all the people that she loved and loved her were in the room with her and she knew it was safe to go. She sounds stupid but it was beautiful but it was horrific because because I wouldn't wake up to the smile anymore. <laughs> But I just want her back. I just want her back every day. Every day. And sometimes, the first couple of months, you're just in shock. You're walking in zombie mode, just a zombie. Um, you can talk to people. The next day, I should have been going into a meeting about our bullying grievance. And... My colleagues came and told me the outcome of the meeting and I'm having a conversation with them as if as if nothing had happened. And then two minutes later, I'm on the floor screaming. And you just... I mean, I've lost my mum. I've lost my stepdad. Nothing. Nothing ever, ever, ever can compare to lose it, your child and you always feel sympathy for someone and empathy for someone who is in that position but until you feel that pain you can't describe it you can't describe it but I would go through that every day for the rest of my life every day the rather than not have her at all. Because if I hadn't have had her, if we hadn't have had that wonderful human being in our family, we'd be, who knows what we'd be? We'd be interested in money, we'd be interested in holidays, we'd be interested in the latest gadget, we'd be interested in all kinds of crap that doesn't mean a damn thing in life. She taught us what was important, what was valuable in every aspect of life without ever speaking a word. She taught us that. So we were the lucky ones. We were the lucky ones. So privileged. She was the most, and I, I hate saying was because I, she still is, the most amazing human being on the planet and she was ours um, I felt it was really important for me to put Lisa's life into the context of our family at her funeral because a lot of people will have thought it was a relief 
that we didn't have that responsibility or they perceived her as a burden, as a lot of disabled people are perceived as. So for me, standing up and talking about her, the person she was and what she gave to us was really, really important to me because I didn't want anyone to think that it was a relief for us. And I did thank everybody that we'd got support from. But I finished it off by saying, however, the biggest thank you goes to our Lisa Bobbles. People say, oh, you were really good parents. You gave us so much. <sighs> no, we gave nothing and took everything. Lisa, you gave us love. You gave us direction. You gave us life. You gave us meaning. You gave us joy. Everything you did was selfless, you beautiful, beautiful girl. We are the luckiest family on the planet to have been able to call you ours and we would go through the horror of losing you every day for the rest of our lives rather than not have had you at all. We are all in awe of you. We all miss you so much and we will live every day trying to live up to the example you showed us. We love you so much, Lisa Mary Smith, you perfect human being. You chose us. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And I do every day. Oh, God. Why did I bother putting makeup on? <laughs> I miss her so much. I do. I miss that gorgeous laugh. I miss the toys flying into my face from a distance <laughs> of five feet when I'm trying to have a cup of tea. Funniest thing she ever did was with Kieran. I told you the other day, who was our eldest grandson, who just learned to walk and thought it would be hysterical to give it a good kick because she crawled on the floor. So we gave it a kick and he had this little tiny round head and she just picked him up by his head <laughs> and lashed him across the room <laughs> and he sort of spread eagles against the toy box. And it was like, you're not going to do that again, are you, mate? And that was it. He never, ever, ever kicked her again. It was so funny. That's how you teach someone a lesson. <laughs> In one fell swoop. She was so funny. Disability. Question mark. I have the ability, the ability to light up a room. I have the ability to light up your heart. I have the ability to light up your life. And for those of you who let me, this is exactly what I did every single day. I nailed it. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.